Hello everybody and welcome to another Mullen Studios podcast after, what, three months? Something like that. Three months. <laughs> uh, we just haven't got around to doing one, but we're back for a limited amount of time, hopefully. But it gave me a good chance to think of more topics. I was uh, running out of stuff to say, actually. <laughs> so it's like these nice little flea month gaffes. They can, they can do wonders, except make you wonder when's the next podcast recording is going to be. <laughs> Right. Uh, 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 before I do, I know in the last episode I messed this up. But I have to ask the most important question of the day. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. All right. Do you want to go first or me? Or? Uh, you can go first. Okay. Um. Oh dear. I don't even. Oh bother. I'm not even sure which one I want to start with. Um. Okay. I think I got one. So this is actually something that I talked about months ago. Uh, I did a video called Rambling More About Neptunia, uh, mentioning about some of the figurines, like they uh, announced some new figurines line, like they announced like a Purple Heart, and then Noirbus, like, uh, I want, I mean, nothing wrong with them, but I would like to see more variety characters, and this is just a question uh, that I know you are also defend about, is game companies making figurines of more diverse cast members instead of just sticking with uh, three different versions of Sora or not not trying to make fun I'm just using it as an example no, no or that's right on the nail with me <laughs> yeah or like not ma or making four different versions of uh, Mario and stuff uh, like a more action not action but more figuring base of other characters or something like I know th in reality they can't do every single cast member in one game if they did everyone would be broke and I'd be like oh should, gosh, we make, yeah. should we make more of this character or more of this one because this guy only appeared in one game and people really like him but this other character has appeared in every game so far and everyone really likes Sam uh, but I don't know I'll, I'll first get you ask uh, ask you about it first give your thoughts on this matter about other cast members in games getting their own figurines regardless of popularity or so on personally for me it's a matter of like you know having the complete set because one of the biggest problem when it comes to this issue is that trying to scale them on the right size matter mm -hmm. and that was like one of the biggest issues that I had with some of the figures is that um, some of them are scaled off a little bit by a few uh, centimeters or in some cases an inch or two and that's where it gets really annoying because you want them to be sized portionally correct to where it looks like it was all part of one set. Mm -hmm. But sometimes that doesn't go so well. And so whenever you find uh, one character that goes to one series and then you find another character that goes to a completely different series, you have to wonder, but they're both completely different. Why can't they make them all the same? And whenever you get both of them, you realize that one's bigger than the other and it doesn't work very well. Or one might have more detail than what the other company has put on. Pretty much, yeah. And it's... I'm not going to say it's, it's a matter of opinion, of course, but depending on the company depends on how much resource they have to where they could put all the characters together. Like, it's one thing that you got like Square Enix and if he isn't uh ideal factory but ideal just, ca factory. just call him if uh okay but it's another thing where it's like you got a uh, uh funko pops now admittedly this is a completely different direction but funko pop does it to where it's affordable and they all basically are the same size mm -hmm. you got like your standard size then you've got some that are slightly bigger because that's what they are yeah. and then you got the jumbo size because that's how they're sized technically mm -hmm. so they're proportionally sized perfectly but they haven't quite gotten all of the characters and so my biggest issue is trying to get all the characters of one series and that's where it gets difficult because as of right now when it comes down to it so far Square Enix is slowly starting to do it but they haven't done it quite complete yet you know there's still the fact that yes we have Sora uh, Kairi, Riku, and Mickey, and soon to be Axel from Kingdom Hearts 3, which is good, but then what about the other main characters, such as Donald and Goofy? I think the last time they had a Donald and Goofy figure 
with the exception of what we've gotten from like a few other companies this past two years, was back when Kingdom Hearts 1 first came out. That was like years yeah. ago. Did we have like all of that first set? We didn't have all of them. That much I can uh, tell you that. But we did have quite a bit of them. But oh yeah, those were awesome. Those figures was limited in terms of movement. Per se. Whereas nowadays you can adjust them to where they look like they're about ready to go into combat and stuff like that. So mm. we've cha things have changed since uh, the collecting scene of figures. They've gotten a lot more mobility. They've got a lot more detail to them where you can pose them differently and stuff but the biggest issue is a matter of getting them all to scale the same and all of them in a single set because you know if you got like Kingdom Hearts and then you got something like uh, Neptuna where the cast is just quadruple in numbers and yeah. it's harder and harder to get a whole set of characters even though the reality is it, it's not possible. Yeah I mean I'm not expecting uh, Ideal Factory or Complaha to make Every single character, like, I'm not expecting him to make figurines based of, like, Red, or Cave, Marvy, or even some of the characters that don't get lost, that aren't even recognized as much, like Nisa or anything. But when it comes down to if I did Factory, when I look over the figurines, uh, yes, you could got, you have a few, several different ones. Like, you got a, a smaller version of Pluty that was part of a limited edition set to a Neptunia Victory. And then you also have like the Uni and Nepgear figurines, which I, I love the Uni one. I haven't got Nepgear yet, but she's actually harder to find online. But when it comes down to, to it, most of the Neptunia figurines, the two most popular ones, well, I want to say four, but I'm counting the CPU forms as well, right. is Neptune and Noir, which I understand. I mean, I don't have, I only have the, well, actually, I do have a Neptunia figurine, but that small one that's part of that set as well. Yeah. Uh, part of a difference. Which set. actually got a quite good deal, actually. Not bad. Uh, but, like, as much as I like Neptune and Noir, fine. It's, like, uh, they don't have, like, any figures. Or, like, I think they only have, like, one figure in a blonde. But I have not seen it being sold in like, online. Um, and I know in one game convention in Japan, there was, like, two figurines of Kampa and Vert. But I think there was, like, very, very, very limited quantities. And it's, like... Uh, I wish they can, I'm not asking them to do every single cast member, but make some more, instead of they're just releasing a brand new version of Noir and new version of Purple Heart, like mix it up with different cast members. Like you could still release one of those two, but like mix it up to where maybe you can have Blonde for one year, then next year they can make uh, IF, and then next year they can probably do uh, uh, Uzume and all that, because uh, that's where... Uh, because you only be able to find like one figurine of like one particular character that's not Neptune or Noir. And when they go out, it's harder to try to get them online. Like some of them, uh, like I tried, to, I really will not want to get the Orange Heart and uh, Purple Heart in her four goddesses online yuck. But yet they're expensive uh, as ever to get now. So I mean, it would be nice to make a more diverse cast. Uh, it's like if Square Enix only did... Soy and Wikus, and then maybe once a year they did like uh, like one version of Goofy and that's it and you can't find it no matter how hard you try. Technically they did something like that except it was not with Goofy but it was uh, let's see for a short time they did nothing but recast of because they went from their normal set to their new Kai set. Because the Kai used to be a lot smaller, mm -hmm. and now they're a lot bigger. Before they went to bring ours, they did a bunch of uh, Roxas, Soras, and they did one different Riku, which was completely. Finally, they got the Kingdom Hearts two Riku. They had never done a figure of Kingdom Hearts two Riku, and it, it was like, yes, we finally have him. Except he's a different series compared to everything else we've had so far. Yeah. Because of course, you had the redone of Sora from Kingdom Hearts 2, his Halloween form. Uh, you had Roxas with both his Twilight version as well as his organization version. And it was like, okay, well, this is great and all, but what about all the other characters? You know, what about Leon, Sid, Cloud, uh, Yuffie, Eris, and all that stuff? Have I, I done one of... Didn't mean, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but what about Terra and Ven? Uh, or Xehanort? They haven't done any of them. 
Like, that's the only thing they've done was Aqua, and she's of the standard Kai. She's not a bring our size. So, her scaling is going to be slightly off, if not slightly different, compared to the bring ours versions uh, if I did. Even though I really would like to get her, it's just I know for a fact her scaling is going to be a lot different than the bring ours version. But, I am happy that they are standardizing uh, the bring ours versions because they start to realize that as much as people want to see bigger sized versions, they are at a limited budget. So they're making the bring ours to where they have the same quality texture looks, but they are scaled down. And that I think works well because a lot more people can get them now. And they're a lot more affordable. Now record, yes, they are practically 80 bucks a piece. But it's better than having to pay 180. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's one of the things where pick your poison, you know. It's like, do you want to pay the 80 bucks for uh, a smaller size figure? Or do you want to pay the 180 for a bigger size, which is basically the same thing. It's up like... Three inches difference is I, ridiculous. I will say that if they somehow do end up making one of Master Xehanort, that would be pretty awesome. The day they do that, that's going to be awesome looking. But um, one of the other things that gets me surprised is that you remember how I talked about the Diamond series of Kingdom Hearts. The Diamond Collection? For those um. of you that don't know, the Diamond series... Uh, it's basically, it's sort of like Bondi, where they make different figures and stuff like that. And Diamond decided to jump into the boat with the Kingdom Hearts series. And the only complaint that I have when it comes down to the uh, Diamond versions is that the human characters oh. look extremely derpy. Now I know what you're talking like about. It took me a sec. I couldn't know what it was called. Like, if you had to take the image of the Diamond character Sora... And bring him to the original Sora from the Kingdom Hearts 1 series years ago. They're basically the same derpy looking face. <laughs> I am not lying. But, admittedly, some of the Disney characters look okay except for Donald. Donald is mostly blue. They put purple on him. I'm like, when did Donald have purple? Like, can, can I ask that question? When did they specifically have purple? Although, Pete is the best figurine in that line. I am surprised. He is scaled perfectly alongside with my Donald and Goofy that I've got. And that is of the Bondi set as well. Now, as far as I know, Bondi has not announced making any uh, additional figurines yet. But as far as I know, they have Sora, Mickey, Donald, and Goofy. And I'm hoping that Donald and Goofy, even though they scale well with Pete, I'm hoping they scale well with the Bring Arts figures, because if they do, that would be perfect, which means I wouldn't have to worry about getting Donald and Goofy from the Bring Arts series if they ever decide to make them. Yeah. But that's, uh, that's within a longer project in hand, you know, is Kingdom Hearts 3 is literally within four months away, which is hard to believe it when you think about it, but yeah, four months from now. It's <laughs> gotta be interesting to say the least. Yep. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that, I just want to mention that whole figurine thing. As I would like to have more diverse cast, but and also maybe make a more production line that way people who want to order from Japan won't have to pay so much as it's like low on stock or something and yeah. shipping cost and everything. I, I never could understand why I make the limited uh, amount when they know for a fact that they have a huge fan base behind it, and it's like why make the limited number because the bad thing about it is that you're going to get scalpers. Basically, they're going to buy like two to three, and they're going to sell them at triple the price. And the company knows this. One of the questions that I have here is the whole pre-order games. Now, a couple of months back, uh, I think it was in Germany, wasn't it? I have no idea. I forgot what it was, but there was a certain uh, region that basically forbid... forbid pre-orders being active unless they had a official release date. If they did not have an official release date, they could not set pre-orders up. And this was during this time where um, it was either, I think it was somewhat after EA's dilemma when it comes to like the pre-order stuff. And then of course you also have the Red Dead Redemption 2 
which had like ridiculous pre-order stuff and everything. So many different versions. Yeah, like but the standard, the deluxe, the deluxe, deluxe, the super duper deluxe, the super duper oopa loopa deluxe, and then if you want everything, give us your life. But version. basically, but basically, uh, the region basically stated that it had to be within uh, the release date. If it didn't have a release date, it could not, and it had to be a confirmed solid release date. Like, within the year of its actual release. So, like, say there's a game that's supposed to be released within, like, February. Then you could set up pre-orders. But if it's, like, from December of next year, then you couldn't set the pre-orders up. They basically made that an actual rule over in the other countries. And I'm hoping that carries over eventually, because pre-orders can be a little bit risque at times, you know. You know, you first start off with the fact that the game is being made in the process, and then shortly after the game gets announced that it's in development, not so much release date, but in development, you then get like 10 different uh, companies that's already got the listing of a pre-order in it. And that game may not get released until like 3 to 5 years. So if you pre-ordered it back when it first got announced to begin with, that could get nullified, technically. Yeah. Uh, I have this sort of love-hate relationship with pre-orders. Uh, I'm not against them, personally. I, I, I always like to pre-order. Like, if it's a game I absolutely love. I don't do it all the time. Uh, I think I only pre-order, like, maybe seven games my entire life. I'm not sure. But, the other, but one thing I hate is whenever I walk in GameStop and the and the cashier always is tend like, would you like to pre? If they just like ask if I have anything to pre-order, it's like, uh, no thank you. Then yeah, that's cool. But if they like push, push the pre-order, it's like, come on man, you got pre-order something. You can pre-order. I can feel you. It's like, dude, I just wanna buy this keychain. Shut up. <laughs> it's like they keep tempting me pre-order. Like it's like. like and they keep mentioning so many different pre-orders. Like, I don't care about Dragon Ball Fighters 2, the gunship of Jehovah's and all that. I just, I just want to buy a book. That's it. Yeah, it's like they keep pushing the pre-orders. And it's just, it irks me so much as I get peer pressured. Which is why that's how I ended up getting to Starlink. I was peer pressured and I hate that so much. Yeah. Hate it, hate it, hate it. My general rule is, is that I'll only do pre-orders if it does have a confirmed release date and if it is a confirmed release date it has to be within like less than a year if it's over a year then I won't bother with it but if it's less than a year and everything then I will go for that pre-order and especially if I have the option to where I can do payments uh, until it gets to its ultimate release that I actually like a lot better because then yeah. you're not having to shell out 80 in a single spot and instead you're just putting like tens and twenties at a time yeah, and to be fair, personally, I would love to see the uh, pre-order law they have Germany come over here. As um, uh, I'm not sure if this happens. So I don't think this happens a whole lot. But I remember one example of like a game was available pre-order, but the game was later canceled, and the company just took the money with them. I can't remember. I remember hearing something about that. I can't remember what it was, but to make sure that the company doesn't like try to uh, do a bait and switch with the with the customers pre-orders uh, money or like if they're still in longer developments and then all of a sudden at the last six months they announce a brand new pre-order special uh, that no one wasn't aware of or something like give us all the pre-order informations when you have the release date that way you're not gonna make this huge pre-order bonus saying have people pay $150 for it and then uh, uh, go behind the backs with it, in a way. Right. Basically, you give a $200 pre-order, a customer purchase it, and then turn around and have that completely disappear, and as though as if it never existed, and a company just took the money, basically. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure how often that is. Uh, I don't think it It, it used to happen quite a bit a few years ago. I remember hearing that a lot, and it was quite a scummy move, to say the least. Yeah, I'm not sure if it happens much now, but I would really like to see 
that law come over. I mean, I know that maybe some people... Actually, I don't even know why people would be upset for not pre-ordering the game. Like, I want to pre-order this game. You do realize it's not coming out in, like, two years. Like, they haven't even confirmed they I want to pre-order it. Take my money. Take my money. Take my money. You know, those are the type of people that just don't understand is like... You know, it's better just to wait until there's a confirmed release date because then you're just throwing away money for a game that may ultimately be cancelled in the long run. Oh heck, uh, sometimes pre-order, you know, later on next year they'll release a game of the year with all the DLC included and cheaper. Yeah, pretty uh, much. I'm not saying that's like every game, but like most of the time with AAA games like with the Tomb Raiders, Assassin, well, I don't know about the Assassin's Creed, or like Fallout, a series they'll release a game in a year with all the extra content in a year and a half away you know pretty much yeah i mean it's basically to be a spec to any game that has a form of dlc and if it's popular enough they'll release another one with the dlc yeah. i mean if you absolutely love the game i'm not stopping you i mean if you love the game the much that you want to support that company with buying the additional season passes going ahead I'm yeah not... there, there's nothing wrong but with that but if you're one of those people that are like I want to get this game, but I don't want to pay the extra DLC or anything. It's best to just wait a year or two until they get a game of the year, especially if it's extremely popular. That's why I usually try to have a general rule, which is that I won't get a new game unless it's one that I really want. And my limit, which unfortunately may change in 2019, uh, my limit is mostly five uh, new games per year. Because depending on the new game itself, sometimes they could have like a special figure or something like that. And that usually costs us extra money. And so therefore it adds up. So I usually try to go for games that I'm wanting to play as soon as they come out. And if nothing else, I try to keep it within a limited budget. Sometimes that doesn't work so well. Yeah, I think the most I paid for pre-order... I'm trying to think here. <laughs> it's hard to remember. I think the most I paid the pre-order is like, it was either this. Actually, no. I think the Four Goddesses Online edition was about close to ninety dollars, which not bad. What? I I I went over that. <laughs> okay, this is the Price is Right. I'm gonna guess, a hundred and twenty. Uh. Say higher or lower. Higher, technically. You know which one it is. Oh, the Kingdom Hearts. 250, I think, if I'm Holy honest. crap, and I thought the Final... F oh, wait, no, you didn't get the Super Deluxe version of Final Yeah, Final because Super they Team. ran out. And the funny thing was, about like a week after the game came out, where I didn't have the money anyway, they said, oh, we have the uh, Ultimate Deluxe Edition available. Do you want it still? And it's like... You wait a week after the game comes out, and I have no money. Oh. Timing yourself is really important here. Uh, yeah, I think that's also another thing, too, with the pre-orders, is the time and convenience, like you said. Uh, I mean, record, that's why you get put it on a waiting <coughs> list and stuff, but still, that was like, oh my gosh. Uh, but, uh, I'm, I'm, oh, I would like to see that will happen. Uh, over here. Hopefully they'll improve it, uh, but who's to say when? Yeah. Alright, this one should be pretty interesting for both me and you. Um, granted, I don't do this a whole lot nowadays, but trading it, video game trade-ins that we regret trading in. Like, I can see you laughing. Okay, yesterday, for example, you have a collection like mine! There. <laughs> and you see, like, maybe a few games like I don't play this a lot. It's like you trade it in, you get some cash back, and you buy games that you definitely want to play, and you're playing a lot. But then, about six months or a year, you said, "Wow, I have a scratching feeling I want to play this one game again." Wait up! Wait up! Where the heck? Ah, oh, crap! I traded it in. You know, it's like I'm gonna first stop this out with me. I know you have a lot of stories. Yeah. Um. It's really hard for me to remember all the trade-ins I've done, considering I've also gained a lot of them back. Right. But I remember, don't ask me why I did this, don't ask me why, when I first discovered this game shop in Cookville, and doing trade-ins, there were some games that I wanted to get more of, and I remember taking 
you can some my N64 games. Uh, it's like, I want to get some more retro games that I want to definitely play for like the GameCube or the, uh, or maybe for like the PS2 and stuff. Uh, keep in mind this was back when I was in high school. Uh, and it's like, you see, which games I don't tr play in a hold on? Like, oh yeah, Diddy Kong Racing and uh, Star, Star Wars Shadow of the Empire. N64 games that I just haven't touched in a long time and traded it in as I wanted to play like, I can't remember what games it purchased, but there was a few Super Nintendo and GameCube games I was willing to want to play and then months later I realized I just traded in Diddy Kong Racing and Star Wars Shadow of the Empire. I mean, I got them back now. I got them and I got my copies, uh, not my exact same, but like I got those games back, but it's one of those things where I don't do trade-ins that much anymore, mostly since I, if I have a good memories of the game or something, I'll keep it or something along that line, but I feel kind of bad, uh, even though it's been years ago, trading those games in for a di completely different game, even though at the time I was really wanting to play that one game, and it's like, well, I don't play these much, so I could just get trade them in for cash and get it in or something. But now we go on to you, because you have an interesting history. Uh, I, I'm going to say this right now, and this will probably be a discussion that I'm going to bring up later on in the future, probably. That's right. But there was a long history of where I did nothing but trade-ins, because I knew there was going to be a higher quality being brought in later on. You know, back in PlayStation 3, where we had the remaster versions. You know, you had the Jack and Daxter, the Ratchet and Clank, which I gave them to you, technically. Yeah, I got them in. Yeah. So, uh, they're not traded in. You asked me if uh, you could have them, and I was like, well, since I'm getting the remaster versions, I'll give them to you. Plus, they still so. you can find on the PS2. Oh, yeah. They're fine. They're fine. But, but uh, anyway, then you got, like, the God of Wars. Uh, then you got the announcement that they had, which was Final Fantasy X. And because of that, I decided to trade in Final Fantasy X and XII. Well, keep in mind, when they first made that announcement, it took them a couple of years. And all of a sudden, I had this itch of, like, wanting to play Final Fantasy X. Naturally, that was the same instance of where I didn't have it. The one game that I regret, thankfully, I got them back. But the one game I regret trading in was the Dot Hack series. Oh, yeah! That's why you did trade them in. I traded them all in. Uh, I can't remember what I got for them. Uh, what games I got because it was quite a bit because technically they are a little bit of the pricey side. Yeah. But uh, as years went on, it was like, you know what? I'm actually wanting to play Dot Hack again. Let's see how much they are. And I was like, holy sh! <laughs> they were like 200, 300 bucks if you want the whole freaking set. <laughs> that's not just the main four or the main three. That was all of them combined. So it's like, if you wanted to get like. And trying to get them individually. Don't get them individually. No, 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 no. That would be ridiculously Get them stupid. all. Make sure you have all four games for the first Dark Hack. And then the three games for GU. Was it three or four? Uh, technically three in okay. PS2. Now, thankfully, though, the GU series had been released as remastered for the PlayStation 4 with an extra fourth one, which apparently, according to what I was reading, uh, someone said in the comments on my channel whenever I mentioned this, that technically it was the Japanese exclusive fourth part of GU, which I did not know. Because when you look at it, the graphics is slightly different than what uh, GU looked at for the PlayStation 2. Was so, it released for the PS3? Or? I don't know. I hadn't looked into it. But it looked like it was going to be like some form of an OVA. But no, it's an actual playable chapter. And I did not know this. So Was there a bunch of loose ends after the last... I haven't played GU, so I, I'm not sure. But when you played the last disc of GU, did it feel unfinished? Like there was some unexplained story continuity? or Technically, no. Because there's like... Technically, it's a secret uh, optional uh, level where you go through the Forest of Pain. And it's basically a 100-level dungeon of going all the way towards the end. And technically, at the end of that dungeon, it does give, like, a special story ending where you get to meet Ova, uh, Ovon. And technically, it's like, I thought it tied up loose ends relatively fine. It was like, okay, so Ovon is technically alive. He's still there. 
and eventually he'll come back to the real world. But apparently in part four of GU, Ova, Ovon is still trapped within the world. So I guess you're trying to free him, but I don't know because I haven't gotten it yet. Uh, I will eventually and then I'll give my update opinion on it, but that was like something that I did not know of. But it's good saying that the GU series is available and it's easy to get now. Whereas the original four, I wish they would do something with that, you know? Because let's face it, those things go up in prices a lot more each year. And the fact that they haven't done like a digital, fo digital version for that matter, it kind of irks me. Because these are really good games. It just, it makes it hard to get them because of how expensive they are. Although you mentioned something about an OVA version of that. I actually wouldn't, actually wouldn't mind seeing something like that done in more RPGs. Make like an additional uh, storyline where it's actually something, it's the story but told in a different way or something. I actually would like to see more RPGs do that. Well technically Dot Hack is basically a unique series where it combines elements of the main video game series. Then you've got the anime series like Dot Hack Sign and Dot Hack Roost, which coexist with the other two games. And then you've got the manga series. And so Dot Hack is way bigger than most video game genres. They've got other stuff that connects to each other and it basically tells a different story, explaining in a bigger light. Oh, okay. Now, Record is not like Kingdom Hearts where you have to play or read every single thing to know all the details. Technically, you can get the main story access without actually having to have all of the material at your hands. Thankfully, they're more or less like little notches to help make the game or make the anime more interesting, I guess. Or like a fan knows, like, oh hey, that's a reference to the anime, I got it! <laughs> exactly! <laughs> you booey Easter eggs. But yeah, it, it's... The dog hack was my biggest regret. Thankfully, I did get it back that following Christmas, but I did regret trading those in. I think everyone has trainings that they regret. Everyone oh, does, at least. But I got the games back and I don't really plan on doing any more trade-ins. Like, technically this isn't a trade-in, but I know when I was joking over some of the games and movies that I uh, don't care much for anymore, or like movies that I have less taste for now, uh, I didn't really take them, I just got, took them to that Good Samaritans. Right. Although it's gonna be funny to see someone See a PS4 copy of Soda Online Hollow Realization. It's like, oh hey, one dollar, cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it's one of those things where every once in a while they'll get a good deal out of it. Yeah. Then again, I didn't really want to. Uh, I didn't really want money. I just want to take them to someone else who will appreciate them more than me. Nowadays, I try to be careful when it comes to trade-ins. For example, you now have like the PS4 versions of. Uh, Devil May Cry trilogy, and then like the PS4 versions of uh, Final Fantasy X and X2. Is so, Jack a Daxu? Technically, but they're only available digitally. Okay, I can remember. Yeah. So, literally, whenever I see that, I have to literally stop myself from moving any forward and think to myself, do I really want that? Is there a bonus to getting them on the next system versus just having them on the PlayStation 3? If James was here, he would probably yell, fuck it. He would. Now, in terms of like Final Fantasy X and X-2, there is no major enhancement that is necessarily in terms of enhancing the gameplay. Devil May Cry Trilogy, however, 60 frame per second is a nice touch to have for Devil May Cry 3, 1, and 2. That being said, it's not necessarily mandatory, but seeing it in 60 frames is actually very nice. Lately, I've been more of the frame person rather than I am the uh, quality in picture because while yes having more than 1080p is nice the frameworks is where it really matters in terms of the gameplay and I think people will agree with me whenever I say that yeah um, I don't really do a whole lot of remasters it's like with the Nintendo Switch when they've been bringing lo over a lot of the Wii U games over mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm not against that but there has to be like an incentive, like I love Mario Kart 8, that's my all time favorite Wii U game. And I love, and the reason why I got the Switch, well, first of all, I'm a Mario Kart fanboy. And then two, there was actually a lot of incentive, like the fixed battle mode, which the battle mode 
in the Wii U version, I didn't care much for. Uh, then you had like some other small sayings here and there, and it just yet did really good. It's like they actually enhance visually just a tad bit more. Uh, but that's plus they have smaller bonuses that wasn't in the original, which is always yeah, nice. Yeah, but for like so many other Wii U games, like the uh, uh, High World, well, I'm trying to think here. Like Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze, I got the Wii U version, it's fine. I know in this one, they, uh... They that did, uh... The what, Funky, Funky Kong, Kong. Uh, as a playable character. But it's like, uh, do I really want to fuck 60 bucks? I mean, I like the game, but I don't love it as much like I did Mario Kart 8 to make me go out and purchase it again. Right. Now, maybe, now, Pokemon Tournament on the Switch, I will probably end up getting as Scizor is in the game. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Uh, but like, uh, uh, technically he was in the arcade version along with two other playable Pokemon, I can't remember. But they bought them over and I really love Pokemon tournaments. Like, I'm probably going to end up getting that as I really like the game. Uh, so it's like a matter of, for those remasters to figure out, okay, I want to get, I love this game, but is there really enough incentive to get it again? Uh, I think we just got to point out what they're going to, Bring these titles from like the PS2, PS3 era, and continually coming, having them come back with each console generation, uh, as people love them so much. And for those who haven't was a, wasn't able to get them for either the PS2 and PS3, and I'm not sure if this happens a lot, but getting those versions can be a bit harder said than come. Getting them more accessible on the newer systems will it's easier for them to get hooked on. And it's a new experience to them that they can go back to. And each cycle when they bring this game out, it's like, oh, I can revisit it again, and so on. Yeah, and even with this year, this year we had a lot of remaster and re-releases coming out. You know, mm -hmm. you have the Catherine, which I don't know about that one. Whenever I looked at it, I thought that maybe it might have been like a Japanese exclusive DLC or something. I don't know. I would have to ask uh, our friend. Uh, John, he's played it. Yeah, he played it excessively. But I don't know if he would know about this little secret additional story when it comes to Catherine. But I think that would be enough reason for anyone to get the PS4 version of Catherine. And then you got Castlevania Symphony of the Night uh, coming out for PS4. And it's bundled with another game... Uh, I forgot what it's called. Uh, Rondon of something or other. But, it was a Castlevania game that was only in Japan? Uh, I th no, technically that one was like a Castlevania X. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, so... Um, I, at least I think so. If I'm not mistaken, it looks like the guy from Castlevania X. But, yeah, it's like there's a lot more games that being remastered and re-released, which is always a good thing. Because that means that people can finally experience these games. What originally was an older title is now being revamped and being re-released for the new consoles for everyone to enjoy. And that was always enjoyable is to see these people playing something that is technically old. But they're playing it for the first time. And It feels like the first time. <laughs> it, 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 it's a nice feeling to have. There is one thing... Speaking of, this isn't on the list, but I just thought about it that uh, with every time, every time we get like Okami or Jack and Dax or like bringing over to the next console uh, generation, there's always like a hundred more titles that people haven't played, and this is related to the uh, ROM issue that we had. Mm -hmm. uh, like I'm not gonna talk about all that with the Nintendo closing down so many different ROM sites. But rather is that there's so many great games that are in these past systems but have not seen the light day out in the public aside from collectors finding a cartridge and, or people just playing ROMs but publicly for like an actual PSN, Nintendo online thing where people can download these uh, games and play them. There's so many that there's like Little Samson uh, or Lickle because I have the Famicom card. I absolutely love, and I would love to see that game come back into the public eye for people to play. And I know there's an issue with game companies that are closed, or like the uh, some companies just don't feel like publishing a game out, which is weird. But it's like we need to find a way legally to make everyone happy, uh, to have all the games like have a service 
where all the games from every system, from SNES, Genesis, PS1 stuff, can all be released publicly online for people to try out. Maybe like a paid subscription service, so like Netflix or the Xbox Game Pass, where you pay a certain amount a month, but you have unlimited access to all these games from all the past systems. But it can't be streaming. It has to be a download yeah, service. Because da- streaming game is not Well, you know, you know what I mean. I know what you mean. That's why you said Xbox and uh, stuff like that. You didn't say PlayStation Now because PlayStation Now is unfortunately a stream Yeah, service. but I mean like Game Pass and all that where you have access to the games and you could play them uh, and all that. Uh, like if there was a way that we can do that to legally make everyone happy, because I know copying games online is form of illegal, yes, but if these games aren't going to be published out, then what's the point of of uh, closing down these ROM sites where there's like over 300 plus games that will never be in the public's eye again or being downloaded uh, to see for purchase, and I wish there was a way where you can do that. There it's- has I don't know if there's a legal law about it, because technically in terms of legal rights, you have to use that particular brand uh, for a certain amount of years, and if it doesn't get used again, then another person has an opportunity to pick up that brand and use it themselves. In other words, if the company doesn't use it, then another person can come around and grab that uh, series or title or whatever and use it themselves. I mean, record they do have to purchase it, but in terms of like how hard it would be, it wouldn't be that hard and difficult. Like for example, I'm just gonna use this as an example uh, with the Gex platformer series. I know technically Square is it Square that has it. I don't think Square owns Gex. I think it's some other company. I don't know, but like Gex, they haven't used that property in forever, and like after 20 years, someone comes by us like. Oh hey, I remember this game. Uh, I would love to do something with this to make it come back. They have to purchase it from them, but they own all the right to Gex right. instead of the former company. Well, let me put it in this perspective too. Um, Gex has actually been re-released on the PlayStation 3 store. Now, technically not physically, but... Wait, digi- it is? Yeah, on the PlayStation store. The original Gex. Yeah, the original uh, Trilogy Gex. If I'm not mistaken, all three of them are on the PlayStation Store, but on the PlayStation 3. And Holy if you crap. Re- and if you remember, the PlayStation 3 and PlayStation 4 are not cross each other. Which, that kind of sucks, It too. does get annoying. In my personal opinion, and I'm no lawyer, I'm no judge. No, me neither. No, you, do I look lawyer? Do we look <laughs> like lawyers to you? I don't think so. But as a gamer, and as a general rule, I believe in the ideal perspective of trying to carry it on if you cannot carry it within the next two console generations someone has the equal right to take that game and put it on a platform for people to play or to use for that matter or or like even if they don't have a new game ideal they can like they loved that game back then and they want people to experience so they can take it the files clean up make sure it's successful maybe Fix some bugs that was in the early versions of that, and yet people play. Right. Every game, I believe every game, that everyone has the right to play any game, regardless if that game is rare, or is in Japan, or was only released for a short amount of time, every game should be played by everyone. Yeah, and the funny thing is, and Pat and Ian talks about this sometimes too, is like a lot of people haven't played all of these older titles. Uh... And guarantee you, if you were to go back and pick up these older titles, they're going to feel like new games because you never experienced them. Well, yeah, them. there's always, like, a... I'm trying to think here. Like, I know how... Uh, crap, hold on. I'm going to take the yuck of my <laughs> I'm trying to think of a good example, but I can't... Uh, oh, oh, yeah, Secret of Mana. I'll use that as an example here. Yeah. Uh, like, I knew about Secret of Mana... Uh, but then when I played it myself, it felt like a completely brand new experience, and it's terrific. Uh, now, granted, I know Secret Mana has been released in virtual consoles for the Wii and Wii U, I believe. 
and as then, well as for like Steam and PS4 yeah. version with the remaster. Yeah, can you get the original version of Secret Mana on PS4? Not the original, but you can get, which I haven't played it yet, I need to just to see what it's like, because a lot of people say it has problems with crashing and stuff, but I don't know, I hadn't really Plus, started to know. It, a lot of people were extremely disappointed with the remake that it was more of a budget end title than an actual dedicated remake or something. Right. Or at least that's what I see. Because looking at it, it doesn't look that polished. It doesn't look bad. It just doesn't look as polished uh, as, a re as a remake could be. The way I see it, it's more of an update rather than a uh, actual remake, per se. An update from the PS4. <laughs> I'm, that's mean. I'm so sorry, but that's how it looks like. You know, you got a fully updated graphics with a full-on voice cast, which, from what it sounds like, it sounds like it's very PS2 voice acting cringeworthy. <laughs> which we all know the PS2 voice actor. Hey, Ke Kingdom Hearts had very good voice acting in it. Yeah, but not all games had this treatment. If you remember, yeah. Um, Although Ratchet and Clank has always had the best voice actors. Oh yeah. Jack and Daxter has some great ones too. Sly Koopa as well. We could go on for this all day. Yeah. <laughs> pretty much this shit. I know it'll be hard for game companies to try to find a legal way to do this. Because uh, you have to go through the other companies and other uh, IP owners and stuff to get, hey, we need to get your game on this uh, service and stuff. I know it's hard and it'll probably take. I mean, heck, uh, I'm not even sure. If we'll ever see something like this happen in the next five years, but if there was a way to have all the games from uh, from all the way back from the Mana Vox Atari era to PS2 for people to enjoy all these games, I think that would be amazing. Oh gosh, I flipped my shit if that ever happened. Now, granted, <laughs> the only drawback is that if that happens, I'm gonna be more focused on that than it's like. Hey, we got a brand new game coming out for the Xbox One and Switch. It's like, I don't care. I'm playing through all 35 games that was released for the Virtual Boy on my system. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, I know it's not 35 games, but I'm just saying that I, I, that would take so much time for me buying new games. But hey, if you make it like 30 bucks a month, I can see. That would be nice. I mean, at least to keep the service up and running and stuff like that. Because, I mean, in reality, when you think about it, all those different titles and licenses that have yet to have seen a new release, re-release for that matter, would be nice to see them, you know? I, I would be up for it because then you got games like Blood Would Tell and stuff like that that are too expensive to get. And getting them on that particular system and everything like that is enough paying for itself and stuff. Or like do like uh, I actually thought of a way that they can keep the service like not drop all the games at once. I'm not expecting that, but this is actually something similar to the what Nintendo Online is doing with the NES. I'm not gonna talk about the online service. Right. I'm just mentioning that uh, they had, haven't dropped all the NES games, but every maybe week or two they do add new games to build yeah. up on that library. I would like to see more Super Nintendo and. And 64 games instead of just NES, but like uh, constantly like add new games. Like this week, you have two new Atari 2600 games, two new Genesis games, three new PS1 games available uh, this week or something. Like keep it fresh to set, make people come back. It's like yeah. if you drop all the games on a service, you will get like ah, uh, which one do I begin with? But like casual like drop in the more popular titles and then. Sprinkle in a couple more each yeah, week or something. Yeah, because within like the first year, it already has got its full list built up as it is. Yeah, and you'll be getting your money's worth easily uh, with it. So that's just something I would love to see happen. Yeah, I mean, you've got to figure something out with this whole freaking copyright thing or trademark type issue. Because if, if companies aren't willing to go as far as to do like re-releases for some of these other ones and stuff like that then where does it go? You know, there has to be like a general rule for this stuff. Actually, this is something I just thought about. What happens if a video game becomes public domain? Like, you know how after 75 years, a short feature film or something becomes public domain, meaning anyone can use it without 
getting copyright strike unless it's like if uh if it was like uh a very popular film they can reinvent that copyright due to popularity but like uh I know there was a Felix a cat cartoon that's now public domain. Uh what happens if a video game gets public domain? What happens then? In all honesty, I couldn't tell you because technically if you had to be honest, we technically are on the verge of that. You know, you've got the original Pong, you've got the original Tetris and stuff like that. When have they ever seen an actual, like, actual re-release rather than a remake or revamp version of those things? Like, Pac-Man has been re-released multiple, multitude of times. The original Pac-Man. but The, the arcade version. Yeah. Like, for the PC version of Tetris that was first created... Uh, that version in particular have not seen like a lot of day or like a PS1 port of Asteroids uh, being seen or something along that line. It's hard to say, you know. You have to like, you would have to look through the entire list. And let's keep in mind, there are million of game listings. So if you had to analyze which one has not been re-released at the most like in the past 30 years... You would narrow it down to like a few, I want to say like a couple million at least of titles that have yet to have been re-released. Because think about it, you've got like 35, 40 plus years of video game history that you have to chronologically log to see, okay, this was released this time period and it didn't get another release uh, until this time period and so on and so forth. So it's kind of hard to say. That's, I would love to see someone do an actual graph of that. Uh, That's a lot of work, I, but it would be I would interesting. Give them, I will give them credits, like, bravo, that was wonderful, beautiful. <laughs> but, uh, 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 we, sh we probably want to go ahead and add one small thing before we end the video yeah, here. we'll do one quick, one short, tiny microscopic thing. Uh, do you have any that might take up five minutes or something? Uh, I know technically you're wanting to do a uh, mu uh, your uh, review on it, but why don't we talk a little bit about what we've recently been watching a lot of lately for oh, the past yeah. couple of okay, weeks. Oh yeah, okay, so this is just, we're just going to do it real quick as I am making a Del Marshall episode of this. So, I love Mickey Mouse, I always have, uh, and for the longest time I had no idea what the hype was with this new Mickey Mouse cartoon shorts that was made in 2013 created by Pod Rudish. Um, I didn't know much about it, I just thought it acted weird. Uh, I didn't see any clips, no cartoons, I just saw like the illustration, it's like, huh, it might be interesting. Well keep in mind it was also Flashmation and we as retro entrepreneurs are not interested in Flash animation. Uh, yeah. But then all of a sudden I was keep thinking, it's like, I should watch it one of these days and literally one day me and him got off work, and it's like, you know what, I'm tired, there's not much we could do. I want to finally get to sit down and watch it, and we watched the first one, not the chronological release, but my f our first one was Roll Out, and I fell in love with it Oh gosh, instantly. it was beautiful. Again, I don't want to spoil too much in my opinion, but everything about this, it still keeps the treatment and love that we all love by Mickey, the happy-go-lucky guy uh, who has a heart and gold, but had, it still treats it how Mickey should is, but also puts in a modern twist in it, and I just, oh, I'm in love with it. Every single, everything about these cartoons are fantastic. And if you're a Disney fan person of Disney media, for that matter, you can recognize every single reference they put into it. It is beautiful. Yeah, like one part that I freaked it out over was in this one cartoon called Couple Sweaters where Mickey and Minnie are dancing There's these teens. I freaked the heck out when I saw those <laughs> teens. It's like, and for those who don't know, technically they were part of a cartoon segment in Make My Music, I think. Something like that. But I recognize them more from this one VHS tape that I had grown up. Uh, where it's like, all I did in this tape was that they took old Disney cartoon footage and put it into songs for like Motown and such. And I recognized them from this one bit, which was one of my favorites. It was to the song Yes Go to the Hop, and they used that segment. And I freaked out. I was like, 
I'm not the only person who remembers them. I was just, oh, I was so happy to see those uh, teens after so long. It's just, it's a nice cute reference. Uh, the the one that got me the most, which admittedly was probably hilarious, but it was uh, another fourth wall reference type thing. Uh, I forgot what the episode was called. It's something about with Mickey's car and stuff. But Mickey gets injured really badly to a point to where he's kind of in a daze and he's like, Walt, is that you? <laughs> At that point, that's whenever you go, Because yeah. it's like, it's 90 years! It's like, oh gosh, that is dark. Um, it does... What the Sam heck was that? <laughs> that sounded like a train. Um, I don't know if anyone could hear that, but there was like a loud honk and it scared the heck out of us. It sounded like a train and I was like, where the fucking train come from? Watch out, Thomas is coming for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, I am going to make a Dale Marshall episode of this sometime maybe this month, hopefully. Uh, but if you want if you haven't watched these Mickey Mouse cartoons, my top five favorite are The Fancy Gentleman, New Shoes, Wonders of the Deep, Dog Show, and then oh gosh, there's too many good ones. Oh, Goofy's Grandma. Here comes Grandma. Here comes Grandma. <laughs> yeah, those are my five personal favorites. Oh wait, no, I'll trade Goofy's Grandma with Nature's Wonderland. <laughs> no, that was such a fun. <laughs> My oh. favorite is the boiler room, especially the part where uh, Mickey's heart stops beating because he told him to stop, and it literally stops him, and he's like, Change my mind! Keep beating! <laughs> yeah. Uh, once again, I want to mention back to you, even though this is a brand new take, it still is Mickey. I mean, heck, Brett Ivan, who's the current voice actor for Mickey, isn't voicing him in the series. It's actually... Chris, I'm not even going to pronounce his name. I know it's Greek. He's He plays as Mo in the Flea Stooges, which I personally liked that one. Aside from that baby scene, that one's just... <coughs> but uh, he, actually does a, he actually does really good with Mickey. He sti it still is the Mickey that I know and love from like House of Mouse and the cartoons where he's a little mischievous but loves going on adventures and helping everyone and having that heart of gold. But he adds so much new life to this Mickey and just the ultimate sugar highs. It's like in Nature's Wonderland, uh, he goes into the, uh, this cave and trying to find the rainbow caverns. And Minnie's scared. It's like, I don't like this. And Mickey's just over here just happy. He's like, oh, come on, Minnie's not that scary if you just believe. It's just this Mickey's on the ultimate of sugar highs. He's high on life. And it's just, oh, it's just incredible. Oh gosh, mighty. Uh, but uh, yeah, that should be it. We, at least that should. That's all I got so far. It's uh, it's good making these again after taking a while. Yeah, we will try to do them a little bit more often because of my new schedule setup that I'm doing. So maybe every. I know we would. We agree we're gonna try every week for maybe every two weeks probably. Something like that. Yeah. I think we'll, that we don't have schedules. Then again, if you watch my videos. You know, I have no schedule for my videos. I don't. Uh, I just make them as I go. But uh, if you have any suggestions for any future Mullins Studios podcast episodes, uh, you can either comment on the video below or go to my email, delmarmullinsflea at gmail.com. That's my personal email address if you want to have any questions that you want to ask here on the podcast. And uh, yeah, I think that should be about does it. I'm ready to go... Uh, pick up a friend and annoy him for the rest of the day so you've been warned Tommy <laughs> <laughs> but uh anything you want to add Chris or uh not just what we've talked about okay so thank you guys for watching this God bless you and we will see you all on the next Mullen Studios podcast bye catch you later guys <laughs>